But just as important too, it's like Ronald Reagan said, right? And I love this quote, uh, trust but verify. and that's Hunter Brown versus Affinity Lifestyle. Just go ahead and set forth our appearances. We'll start first with the plaintiff, then we'll move to the defense. Your Honor, welcome to Tate Park for the plaintiff. Good morning, Your Honor. Jim Kavanaugh for defendant ETT1 LLC, DBA Terrible Herbs. Nam Peltzenberg, good morning, Your Honor. Also for ETT1, which I will call ETT today. All right. Good morning, Your Honor. Joel Ledoux on behalf of Real Water from AlightSales.com. Observing is Matthew Kaufman on Zoom. In addition, I see my co-counsel on Zoom, Eric Freeman from Hawkins Barnum. Good morning, Your Honor. Jacqueline Franco, bar number 13344 with Bacchus Burden on behalf of Albertsons LLC. With me today is our newest associate, Jamie Clark. I thought you were a juror. <laughs> Does that cover all appearances? Good morning, Your Honor. This is Lorene Frister, 13217 for KV Distributors of Nevada. Good morning, Your Honor. Dodd Grill, Bar 9000, Council for Nevada Beverage. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Aaron Austin, Bachrigger, on behalf of Costco. Caitlin Zach for KV Distributors, admitted Pro Hawk Region. All right, does that cover all appearances? Okay, I guess we have a few matters on. Uh, let's deal with some of the easy matters first before we get to the uh, contested motions. Um, we have a uh, motion to associate counsel in an order short in time. That appears to be uncontested, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. And uh, as far as, uh, let's go ahead and deal with the motion. Mr. Kavanaugh. Would that your motion? No. I have a, Your, your Honor, I'm not. Uh, which motion are you talking about? The motion to associate counsel. Yes, Your Honor. It was uncontested motion to associate Mr. Brian Ledger. He's with the firm Gordon Rees, Scully Mansukani, but he's located in California. And uh, we've received the necessary clearance from the state bar, and now we presented the motion to associate to Your Honor. Okay, we're going to grant it with no opposition. Thank you, sir. So we'll take that off the table. Um, you want to talk about the jury questionnaires before or after? Your Honor, I talked to Mr. Odu about it, and uh, we got a little bit of pushback from the jury commissioner about the number of questionnaires. Right. And we had proposed 800 on the bonus of caution because of the publicity. I think the jury commissioner wants a lesser amount, 600 perhaps. Right. And I'm, I'm okay with that. Mr. Du, I think, is okay with that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm of a view that no one reads the newspaper. They yeah. don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, Not anymore. Yeah. Joel, do for real water. Uh, we're fine with the 600. Obviously, if we run into an issue, we'll deal with it. But hey, yeah, we can deal with it. Yeah. Put it this way we'll get the case dry. That's <laughs> probably the best thing I can say. Right, Mr. Parker, I had another 500 jurors in my back pocket. And I've now. never seen that happen before or after. So yes. <laughs> so I'm not worried about that. Okay. So um, where do we go next? Oh, we have the uh, defendant Albertson LLC's motion for leave to have been asked to receive cross claims. Uh, that was on the... Uh, Express indemnity issue, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Indemnity and breach of contract. Jacqueline Frank on behalf of defendant Albertsons. All right, let's go there. Thank you, Your Honor. Defendant Albertsons has brought this motion under 15A. Um, the parties were trying to discuss indemnification over the last 11 months to see if it would be picked up. Unfortunately, we were not able to reach an agreement. Hence, we are before you requesting that you grant our motion for you to amend so that we can assert the claims against Nevada Beverage. Thank you. We'll hear from the opposition. Thank you, Your Honor. Colt Dodrell, Bar 9000, Council for Nevada Beverage. Albertsons has a pending cross claim against Nevada Beverage already for equitable indemnity and contribution. Their motion to amend to join the express uh, indemnity claim should be denied uh, under the uh, NRS 369 485 sub D statute under the uh, alcoholic beverages legislation. Um, we argued in our response that the court cannot enforce an illegal contract. Their claim would be futile, and that's because the 
combative beverage cannot participate indirectly in the operation of a store that sells liquor, such as Albertsons, and the direct indemnity provision would be a sharing of losses, uh, which would be participation of operation. We provided the court that statute, as well as an attorney general letter that was sent to all uh, liquor distributors in the state of Nevada. That's two of the three branches of government uh, that have addressed that. The concern is if the attorney general enforces that, then Nevada beverage could be uh, prosecuted under deceptive trade practices. And as the attorney general warns, that could be criminal prosecution, which could result in suspension of their ability to conduct business. All right. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how an express indemnity agreement pursuant to a contract uh, has any application to uh, operating a, a retail liquor store. I, I wish the uh, Attorney General had given us uh, more guidance, but we're, we're bound by their interpretation. And our, our review is that we would be sharing in the loss. Obviously, there's claims against Albertsons in this case. Um, they're claiming that that would be a loss. They're trying to shift that loss onto us, and that sounds like uh, participation in operation uh, under, a, under a broad interpretation of the statute, which, uh, because it does risk uh, penal consequences, uh, we need to uh, take every, every effort not to expose uh, Nevada beverage to the prosecution. Yeah. Your Honor, these are two sophisticated parties who have entered into a contractual obligation. Nevada does not have um, a policy that states that you cannot have an anti-indemnity language. Sharing of a loss as a result of a product defect that is non-alcoholic, common sense tells you it's not a joint operation of a grocery store it's and not. a distributor. It's not. So go ahead, ma'am. Uh, I, you understood my point directly, Your Honor, and unless you have any questions, I am comfortable submitting. Uh, I don't, and I, I don't mind saying this. I don't always agree with the uh, Attorney General on certain issues. Uh, and regarding some of their opinion letters, I've had scenarios where I've gone another way and uh, I've been affirmed. And uh, my point is this, I don't see how an express indemnity provision pursuant to a contract is participating directly or indirectly in the operation of a retail store. All that simply is, is a sharing of the loss uh, based upon contractual principles. Nothing more, nothing less. Uh, regarding the motion, I'm going to grant it. Thank you, Your Honor. We'll submit a proposed order. All right. Uh, let's move on. Uh, you're welcome, sir. Um, next up, plaintiff's motion to strike Chair or Herbst. Or charitable's answer or a lesser appropriate sanction on an order shortening time. All right. Your Honor, I don't know who I'm arguing against today. Uh, Both of us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Normally, it's a, you know, we, I prefer a one horse, one rider so I can. <clears throat> one horse, one rider? That's what Judge, I prefer. I, well, we, the reason I can't do that is because I just came into the case. So I don't know enough of the facts, and this was on order shortening time. So Jim's going to have to take all the factual issues. I understand. Thank you, Your Honor. So, Your Honor, just so again I can understand who I'm arguing against, I understand that I know these so, people. I mean, factually, it's my recollection of review the points of authorities, we had a significant. Uh, records dump, is that correct? Is that the best I like the way you describe it, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly how I would describe it. How, how was it, 27,000 pages? Of no, no, 271,000. 271,000. Okay. 271,000. That's a lot of documents. <laughs> you know, Objective dump. Pages, Judge, pages. Uh, 270,000 pages. pages of documents deposited. I correct myself. Very good. Thank you. So, Your Honor, let's... That's a lot of pages in documents. So. It, it'll become clear, Your Honor. Okay. When it becomes clear to Your Honor, then hopefully it'll become clear to the rest of us. <laughs> As it stands, Your Honor, I don't believe it's uh, clear what those documents uh, will, how they will play out in this case. But, Your Honor, just to make things easier going forward, may I approach the bench and provide a copy of Terrible's uh, fourth supplement in RCP 1601. Make sure Mr. Cavanaugh has had a chance to look first. Oh, he prepared it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I'll take a copy if you're going to hand it. You'll take my copy. All right, you yeah, have my you, copy. You, uh, what the heck? Go right in. And, yeah. and it's my understanding. This I'll, is. I'll a, use it after you. Then. Okay. That's more helpful to you. That, that's fine. And for the record, this would be. Um, This would be disclosures, is that correct, Mr. Gordon? That is correct, Your Honor. Terrible Hertz produced this document, and I, I provided it to the court now because when we filed our initial motion, Your Honor, we anticipated that Terrible's <clears throat> would be producing additional documents based upon the evidentiary hearing held in the Hunt-Wartson case during trial. Right. And we were told that going into that evidentiary hearing, we were told by way of depositions, by way of written discovery responses, and by declarations that there were no more documents and that Terribles had produced everything. And so we get into the evidentiary hearing, and I will tell the court, as we've done so in our briefing, that each one of the terrible witnesses, each one of them, we called four during the evidentiary hearing, I examined all four, and all four admitted that they had given false testimony or inaccurate testimony during their deposition and during the, and in their declarations. And they admitted to this in front of Judge Kishner. This came to light because accidentally, Terrible's prior counsel, Colvin O'Connor, sent to Brianna Switzler of Mr. Kemp's firm an email she happened to be on a string of recipients, that we found 11 documents that pertain to the Henry case. So I see this over the weekend. This is the weekend before the Martin Luther King holiday. I, send a, I quickly sent a 2.34 letter saying, we need to see those 11 pages um, immediately. And we need to discuss why they weren't produced. We get those 11 pages. And in between that weekend and the next day of trial, 290 pages show up. So it goes from 11 pages to 290 pages. So we go into day number six of trial. Judge Kishner decided to have the evidentiary hearing based upon our motion to strike. And I call as our first witness the terrible herbs. Give you this title, Your Honor, just so you'll know. And this is Mr. Brian Breeden. He's the first witness we called. He's the vice president of advertising and marketing. And if you go to Exhibit One of our motion, Your Honor, got it right here. And if you could go to page eighteen. Exhibit one, just for the court's record, is a transcript of the evidentiary hearing. It is January 24th, 2024. I'm sorry, January 23rd, 2024, and it's day six of the trial. So you see that we're in trial mode, and we're having to do this evidentiary hearing during trial. Page eight. At the bottom, starting at line 21, I introduced the issue and I talked about the 11 documents that I just described to the court and the 290 pages we eventually received. I discussed the 2.34 letter, but most important, Your Honor, to this case, if you go to page 19. I have a red button. It says, this is coming from, again, Terrible's prior counsel. I'm not attributing this to Gordon and Reese, nor to my friend, Mr. Jim Cavanaugh over there. It says here in lines 11 and 12, during searches for documents responsive to the Henry case, case we're here to talk about, request for production using the term drinkrealwater.com, which is in quotation marks, I understand terrible hurt located emails from 2019 that may be relevant to the Hunt Wharton case, which is a trial that was in front of Judge uh, Kishner on it. Now that's an admission related to Hunt Wards and under 16.1 that these documents should have been produced over two years ago, October 15, 2021. Now I want the court to understand that this case has been consolidated for purpose of discovery 
long time ago. A lo thank you, Jan. A long time ago. Coordinated, yes. Judge. Coordinated. That's fine. I'm more, I'm more than happy to use Mr. Posenberg's word, coordinated, for purposes of discovery. And I use the court's words a long time ago. So I think Mr. Posenberg knows more about the facts than he pretends to be. Pretend, pretended not to know early on. Well, I know, I know legal distinctions. Well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll, see. we'll keep him to the facts. You to legal distinctions. So, Your Honor, Kishner hears this. Judge Kishner hears what's going on, and I point this out because the Henley case is at issue. And based on the fact that these cases were consolidated a long time ago. These documents should have been produced a long time ago. Objection, Your Honor. Again, he's calling this a consolidated case. It is not a consolidated case with Hunwardson, Your Honor. And this is going to be misleading, and it's going to be replete in the record. This is not a consolidated case that we're here about with Hunwardson. Never has, never was. It's coordinated for discovery. The very same discovery CMO order the plaintiffs have ignored to bring this straight to the court, this alleged discovery abuse problem. Right. Thank you, Mr. Kavanaugh. So now I know that I got two riders talking about coordinations versus consolidated. So July, just to make it straight, Your Honor, July 11, 2022, the cases were coordinated for purposes of discovery. I also want the court to be aware of the fact that Carables was named in this case March 7, 2023. Two months later, they did their initial 16.1. Those documents did not include the 11 pages, the 290 pages, or the 271,000 pages that we received last month. So, a little pause there just to see if Mr. Kavanaugh and Mr. Poldenberg had something to say about those dates. But they don't, so we'll keep moving on. The, after that, the 290 pages were disclosed in this case, Your Honor, January 16th, 2024, which is a few days before we had the evidentiary hearing in the Hill Watson case. So now, at the very least, Your Honor, we believe these documents should have been produced in accordance with NRCP 16.1 on uh, May 16th, 2023, at the very least, if not before then, based on the coordination of discovery for all the cases on July 11, 2022. And we know that they were not. But we also know, Your Honor, if we go through Exhibit 1, and I'm going to take, it, take the court through this uh, methodically, Your Honor, on page 49 of Exhibit 1, it says here, ETT was in the process of disclosing these documents in the Henry case. That's what it says. These documents, being the 290 that they were speaking of at that time, unfortunately should have included the 271,000 pages that we just received last month. And I point that out because we did not have those 271,000 pages when we prepared the motion in front of the court. We didn't have it because our brief, Your Honor, was filed on... July 17, 2024. However, Terrible's opposition was filed July 31st, 2024, and they failed to mention in their opposition the 271,000 pages that they produced just a week before. What the, what the opposition does is it fixates on the 290 pages, completely ignoring the 271,000 pages. And then it says here, and this is where Judge Kishner I thought was very good at catching the, the, the obvious lapse, uh, lapse in judgment uh, in terms of terrible herbs complying with 16.1. It says here at line 24 and 25, under 16.1, you were planning on doing it or under response in Henry. Because initially, as I pointed out, Your Honor, the attorney, prior attorney for Terrible said, in responding to requests for production of documents under Rule 34, they realized that these documents would be responsive in Henry. Well, if that's the case, this search should have been done 
these documents should have been produced. But they weren't under 34 or 16.1. And then, Your Honor, this is where Mr. Waite, Mr. Posenberg's partner, on page, 30, uh, page 50 says, if you go to the next page, Your Honor, lines, this is lines 2 through 4, the court again trying to figure this out says, I'm just trying to be clear. Henry was a, was a 16.1 or pursuant to a discovery request. And Mr. Waite says, rule 34. So, Your Honor, you're familiar with the due diligence requirements under 16.1, the supplement, uh, supplement, uh, supplementation requirements as well. And you're also familiar with the rule, the rule 34, which requires due diligence and supplementation. These documents should have been produced in either event over a year ago. So Mr. Waite and his explanation, this is lines seven through 18, and I would, uh, steer the court towards 15 through 18. He says, the conduct is consistent with a mistake or at worst negligence or sloppiness, which could be sanctionable. Well, we agree that it is sanctionable, but your honor, sloppiness or negligence compounded by over a year's worth of failures require this court's attention and it requires significant sanctions. There is no way, and I know this because I recall the court, Your Honor, being a practitioner, a, a trial lawyer, before taking the bench. You know how difficult it is to try to incorporate 271,000 pages of documents when you've already completed your initial expert disclosures. You've taken over 70 depositions in the combined or coordinated cases. You've done written discovery. You've tried to plan out what your pretrial motions will be. And to have this amount of paper dropped on you, as you, as the court said, a data dump, this late in the game. I don't know if I said data dump, did I? I think you said document dump, dump your <laughs> but, Close enough. But you corrected it. I as a deposit. I mean, I, I, I mean, I understand the practicalities of uh, practice. And for example, if there are key documents involved in a case, you need those documents early on from a case preparation perspective. You do. I, I get that. Absolutely. Because these documents would be documents that we would use in all of these depositions. They would be used to first authenticate the documents. They'd be used to set up testimony for our experts. They'd be used for further written discovery or determining if there's other potential witnesses that should be deposed. All of those things come along with and are the, I believe, the backbone for why 16.1 is so important. Your Honor, if you go to Exhibit 2, this is the Day 7, January 24, 2024 of the Hunt Morrison trial. Mr. Breeden admits on page 60, uh, 91, I'm sorry, that the representations that he'd made regarding communications between Real Water and Terrible Hertz were absolutely inaccurate, using his words, page 91, line 22. And that testimony that he was referring to was his deposition that was taken. And if you want to just to the court's uh, benefit and to give context to this. On page 11, that's where I asked the question. At the time of your deposition, however, you said that you never heard of the name Amy Jones. Is that correct? Response 14, uh, line 14. I was at, answering truthfully from what I can recall. I had no recollection of, recollection of Amy Jones until I saw the email communication recently. Well, we didn't know until we saw the email communication either, Mr. Breeden. But you would agree with me in front of this court today that the statement during deposition under sworn testimony was a misrepresentation of the truth. And he says it was absolutely inaccurate. The next page, Your Honor, we ask him about Anthony Randolph, who was the vice president of marketing for Real Water. And he denied knowing Anthony Randolph. He admits on page 92 that, again, that was a misrepresentation. And then on lines 11 of 10 through 13, I ask him, 
And then you also testified that there were no communications whatsoever with Rio Water. Do you recall testifying to that during your deposition? He says yes. And that was also a misrepresentation of the truth. Is that correct? And then he says again, and accurate until I found out that it was true. Your Honor, each one of the witnesses terrible uh, placed before us, called as called during the evidentiary hearing, made the same admissions during that evidentiary hearing after giving providing inaccurate deposition testimony and declarations. And I can take the court through all of them because I have them here. I'll give the court another example of this. If you go to page 97, Your Honor, this is my examination of Brian Breeden, continuation of that examination based now upon his declaration as opposed to his deposition. And he says here, based upon, and the question starts at 7, 917. Now, isn't it fair to say, based upon what you have learned recently with the renewed motion for sanctions, the reason why you're here today, that in fact this declaration was also a misrepresentation of the truth? He says, I did do an email search prior to signing this declaration and still found nothing. And then I say, but now you've learned after this trial began, after we began picking this jury, that there were emails. Is that true? Yes, sir. Making this declaration also forth. false, correct? Yes. So at this point, we have three inaccuracies in your deposition, and we have one inaccuracy in your declaration, correct? Yes. Your Honor, I go several pages, and I go paragraph after paragraph after paragraph in this declaration. If you go to page 100, by that time, Lines 15 through 17, I indicate to him, we have now three inaccuracies in the deposition and three inaccuracies in your declaration, correct? Yes. Same is true on page 101, Your Honor. You missed his fourth inaccuracy in the declaration and his fifth. I'm referring the court to uh, page 101, lines 5 through 7, and lines 16 through 18. After completing my examination of Mr. Breeden, I, I examined Mr. Walters. And Mr. Walters was not deposed, but he had he submitted a declaration. And I indicate, well, I ask him, and he agrees on page 137, that his uh, paragraph four of his declaration regarding his search and locating no communication of the doc or agreements between terrible herbs was false. In line seven, would you agree with me that, that this statement was a misrepresentation when it was made? He says no. Do you agree with me that it is now a misrepresentation? He says yes. And he further, page 138, informed, admitted that he advised Chris Kemper, the executive vice, vice president of terrible herbs, that he had not found any communications, no agreements, or contracts with your order. And then lines 13 through 15, but in fact, that statement was incorrect. There were communications, correct? He says yes. Third, Terrible Herbs uh, Executive Vice President, I'm sorry, Vice President, Mr. Sexton. I apologize. Mr. Sexton was actually the Chief uh, Information Officer. He was a person, the head person when it comes to IT at Terrible's. We should have located all of these documents well over a year ago. In my opinion, back in uh, 2022, when these cases were coordinated. He says, this is page 191, Your Honor. Would you agree with me, sir, that the line, that line number one, Terrible Herbs did not have communications with Rio Water employees 2018, 19, and 20, is a misstatement? He says yes. He goes on on page 182 to admit that paragraphs two and three, also of his declaration, were of his declaration were incorrect statements, Sean. And then he tells us on page they 193. They had to know what the truth was. Huh? They had to know. They the had to know, Your Honor. Had to know. That's what I want to hear. They had to know because if there's communications with a specific entity, wouldn't they know about it? 
There's no way around it, John. Wait, 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 wait. And that's my question, because if you're going to put something, set forth facts in a declaration, I would hope you would make sure that those that the declaration is true and accurate. And, and my point is this. I realize, for example, uh, you might have a lot of documents out there, but people know what they've done. Right? They know what their conduct would be, right? For example, if there's communications going on with Rillwater, wouldn't somebody know that? You can jump in. I mean, really. I'm well, not, Your Honor, I mean, it sounds like I have so much to inform the court that I think is kind of taking the court in the wrong direction. But, but, this case was tried and unwarranted to a point and then settled. All the claims in that case were settled. The settlement agreement was confidential. It also included non-disparagement agreements. All that aside, Your Honor, we're here about Henry. So this is being portrayed as there's some sort of the equivalent of a tort crime wave that's being committed by one of the best companies in Nevada, Terrible Herbs. Well, well, They're only in two cases, wait, wait, wait. Henry let me, let me and Hunworth. I'm not looking at it as crimes or criminals. I'm but, looking at looking at this lens when it comes to disclosures, number one. And number two, truth and accuracy is set forth in a declaration. Understood, Your Honor, but he's quoting from a trial testimony in a different case. Terrible is a, a, when you open up any pleading in front of you, Your Honor, you got 19 cases that are coordinated for discovery. Coordinated for discovery. Terrible's is only in two of those. One of them was Hunwartson. The other one is before you today. They're separate cases. They're not consolidated. They were coordinated by a, by a case management order signed by Your Honor and the rest of the district court judges to assign Floyd to deal with this called so-called discovery abuse. It's telling that the entirety of the of the exhibits to, to plaintiff's motion are all about testimony in Hunwardson. They don't include any of the cross-examination. They don't even include the court's full logic on how they arrived at a second hearing was held and how they came up with uh, what was going to be sanctions. I think it was actually applied. I'm not here defending Hunwardson, a case that was settled, all claims settled, in writing, with non-disparagement agreements, and everything here today is disparaging the people at Terrible Herbs. We're here about Henry. Henry was only made, 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 made Terribles a defendant years into after they first filed their claim. They thought it was 7-Eleven they bought. They weren't sure. And then in the second amended complaint, a little more than a year ago, they add Terribles as a defendant. They've only been a defendant in the case before your honor since March of 2023. All right? And in the middle of trial, but, but, they produce... Why, why is that somehow a defense? And, and here's, they, here, here's my point, and then I'll give you a chance to respond. I'm looking here, and this is taken from page 191 of the, I guess, hearing transcript. And there's a simple question of line 14. Sure, would you agree with me, sir, that line... Line number one says, Chilbert Herbst did not have a communication with real water employees in 2018, 2019, and 20. Is that a misstatement? And the response is yes. And uh, next question. Uh, in fact, it was a lie. It was misrepresentation when you signed the declaration, correct? He says, well, not when I signed the declaration. But my point is this. Um, there, there appears to be communication going on. And uh, apparently, uh, that might be part of the 271,000 or whatever pages of, of, of documents. I don't know. But, but it seems to me, and it's a real simple question, wouldn't they know if uh, Cheryl Berherbs in some way, form, or fashion was having, having communications with real life? Well, who? Which, which one? I mean... Well, but see, that's one of the reasons why, number one, it, it, it would, we, we could probably get to who, what, when, and where if well, specific disclosures were made in a timely fashion. Well, if they have application to the claims of Mr. Henry in this case, if they had anything to do with the claims in this case, 
then I agree, Your Honor, we should be considering that. But you're, he's relitigating the failures to have people talking to each other correctly, timely. And in the meantime, in this case, the reason the 290 pages came up in the Hunt-Morrison trial is that they discovered them and deposited them in the case before Your Honor. And it was way less than a year after they amended the second time and added terribles in this case. And this 270,000, Your Honor, can I approach and just show you this? Because you, you can't, but you, but you see, need to see this, Your Honor, and, and, to understand the 270,000. Okay, but, but my, I'm not even focusing on the because it's coming up. I, it, it may be hypothetically under the 271,000 documents or so, maybe only five, six, or 10, or 12 might be germane. Maybe I none. Don't know. Maybe none, but, but he's produced no evidence that any were, Your Honor. But, but here's my question. Um, why would a declaration be prepared that is untrue? Inaccurate. Well, Maybe it was untrue ultimately in terms of accuracy, but it wasn't an intentional misrepresentation. And they never, again, Your Honor, that was in another case that has no applicability to the causes of Mr. Henry here, asserted against terrible herbs. Uh, you know, barely a year ago. Now, I have a, a question in that regard, and I don't know for sure, but hypothetically, if the documents would have produced and you'd have had maybe correct statements set forth in the declaration, maybe that would change the landscape as far as this case is concerned, as far as the claims for relief and, and, and the like. Well, let, let, let me just raise a, a legal objection to the consideration of this. You know, since uh, the phrase that keeps coming to mind is prior bad acts. These, and, and Jim has alluded to that. These are things that happened in another case that Judge Kishner handled and imposed sanctions for. <coughs> now we're like, using I don't want to catch up. I'm not even looking at it from a prior bad acts perspective. But you I'm, are. Well, no, I'm not. I'm looking at it from a Rule 16.1 perspective. And just as important, we have declarations that apparently, apparently appear to be inaccurate. In another case. That's what I'm saying. You're looking at declarations in another case where that issue has been resolved. The issue here is the 11 pages, the 290 pages, the 271,000 pages. But they want to bring in the, the declarations and the things that were done wrong in that case with other counsel that now you're going to get upset about. They want to bring it in. Well, you notice I haven't gotten upset. That's what that's the question. <laughs> I, I've never seen the court upset. <laughs> there's upset and, and then there's upset. Clearly this bothers you or you wouldn't have delved right into that issue when it is really an issue in another case. But, but, but well, it's, here's my point, Mr. Posenberg. You know, I really enjoy talking to you. You know, I do. I enjoy talking with you. Yeah. But here's my point. And, and for example, uh, yes, I'll accept the fact that this was in another case. But I'm looking here, and I don't understand the, the necessary timing. But let me look at it. For example, um, it appears to me the transcript of the proceedings was electronically filed on January 25th of 2024, right? Yeah. And so my point is this, if regardless of whether this was in another case or not, shouldn't the documents have been produced much earlier in this case from a case preparation perspective? Well, if you want to talk about that, that's a great thing to talk about, but that wasn't the court's question. The court's no, but, but, question was, shouldn't have Terrible Herps known about what its dealings with real water? Is it, so isn't this declaration uh, in incorrect. Well, 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 my point is this, um, and it's really this simple. Uh, number one, I would anticipate that they would know about any dealings with real water. I mean, just to really be candid about it. But just as important too, um, it appears to me that at least as of January 25th of 2024, and looking at the transcripts of the proceedings, um, Clearly, that was known from a 
um, coordinated discovery perspective. But, but then we should be talking about the actual production in those three waves. And not all of the, look at the, look at this line in this deposition transcript where I asked him and he said, yes, it was inaccurate. That's all to inflame the court. Now, I know you're not going to look like you're inflamed, no. Judge, but it's bothering you. Well, well, well no, what's, what, see, I, I, I'm looking at it through this lens, and, and, and this is really an important way to look at it because cases are sophisticated and layered. And so in order to adequately prepare a defense and or uh, prosecution in a civil case, you have to have all the evidence. And, and you can't have the evidence uh, deposited, uh, potentially. Um, when was the deposit made again? Last two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. July 24th. And, and, and here's, here's, here's my But Judge, you need, you need to listen to all the facts. Because all the facts. there's a wait, reason wait. why those documents were deposited. Well, well, but here's my point. Let me finish, finish up as far as in my closet. Uh, hypothetically, uh, maybe you're right. Maybe Mr. Kavanaugh's right. There, there's no, they're there. But just as important, too, it's like Ronald Reagan said, and I love this quote, uh, trust but verify. And so, but well, here's my point. Uh, when documents are being deposited that should have been deposited potentially a long time ago, uh, that potentially changes the landscape of the entire discovery because we don't know. Can I finish? Wait, let me judge. Finish. You're prejudging the whole issue. Wait, wait, but I'm just I'm talking about overall case preparation because I don't mind saying it. Heck, if I was given 500 pages of documents, that was a lot of documents for me to review. Let alone uh, a couple hundred thousand pages of documents. And my point is this. We don't, you don't, that impacts case preparation. You've yes. got to listen to what the circumstances are. Uh, please says. let me approach your honor. Uh, but, and, and, and I am going to, Mr. Kavanaugh, have, have I never not? No, you? I know you have. <laughs> I mean, really. I, just, I always enjoy them. It's just that I'm hearing over and over again yeah. about the amount of documents that are so-called dumped. Yeah, but, but you, I, you I, don't I'm understand. striking dumped officially <laughs> from the record. Okay. I notice I went to deposit it or something a little bit more uh, benign. I'll keep it that way. But my point is this, understanding the realities of litigation, um, um, that goes to, because what lawyers, I mean, good lawyers, if you, if you, if you deposit 200,000, let me finish that. What do good lawyers do? They're going to review them. <laughs> and, you know, and, and my point is this, it, it impacts case preparation, it really does, you know? And, uh, and and let's get to the bottom of this because I want to know about the relationship. Right. That's what I need to know. But Mr. Kavanaugh, give me what you got. Yeah, Make sure I, 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 I will, Your Honor. This is a letter written by Mr. Parker to predecessor counsel, May 28th. Uh, yeah, and this, this, is year, a, this year? Yes, yes, Your Honor. And this was, uh, I'd like to introduce it as an exhibit to, this, to, to, to our uh, hearing today, may I? And I'll let you. Any objections, Mr. Parker? Uh, no, I, I actually appreciate the, uh, the request because this is a Hunt Wartson matter, so they they can't complain about Hunt Wartson uh, when it suits me, I guess. This is not a Hunt Wartson matter. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I, I say Hunt your, your, your prior Your prior counsel. You had signed a settlement your prior, agreement. Your prior counsel. Yeah, but this is well after Hunt Wartson's over. It's in the can. I agree. This is your prior the counsel. The money is paid. Mr. Kavanaugh, nothing to do with the words. This dealt with your prior counsel, correct? It did. Not hey, gentlemen, we don't need to go down. No, it did. Uh, ten, okay, that's fine. I want to tell you that was no me, but right now I'm just trying I to get no him corrected. Mr. Kavanaugh, no objection. If, if you would see paragraphs three and five, and I want to explain how you end up with 270,000 pages. When you search a database, it goes back to 2010 by their request. Okay, again. 10 years before Mr. Henry ever saw real water. So, Your Honor, I have no problem with this document, but I'd like to finish, then I'll address this as I Well, it's kind up. of unfair that I'm, I'm giving this up now, but I feel like I have no other choice. So you can address it, of course. Okay. But you might want to do it on the reply after I, I get I a chance to explain where the 270 came from. No worries. I have no problem either way. Your Honor, I'm fine with addressing it now. I'm fine with you addressing were, you it. You were going over your exhibit. It doesn't matter who goes first. I'm yeah, this is too fast. I understand. 
if, if this is the, uh, you know, the, the kryptonite that Mr. Kavanaugh believes it to be, it, then well, great. I don't believe it moves the needle one way or the other. And, and Your Honor, it's also discussed in my opposition and my declaration supporting my opposition. Mr. Parker said a while ago that we ignored this fourth supplemental disclosure. The fourth supplemental disclosure is entirely instigated by the letter demanding a digital forensic exam of my client's computer system. And, and we gave them access. And then they didn't do it. They met with us three times on site. And then we went ahead and did it. We did it for them. We spent scores of thousands of dollars for a third party vendor. And that's all mentioned in my declaration, Your Honor. It's mentioned in the opposition to this motion. And so, it shows why there's no, how do you get to 270? You have terms like Nevada Beverage, the biggest distributor in Nevada. Can I, can I, can I want to know about the relationship. Thank you, Your Honor. relationship. I, I, that's what I want to know about. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. The relationship to the documents deposited is no, what I want to know about, it because I think at the end of the day, it's my recollection in reviewing the points and authorities, and I could be wrong, because I, re I review a lot every day. I don't mind saying, like, today, I was, uh, fortunately, I'm not in trial. Thank God. So, but uh, I just want to know about the alleged relationship. And, and that's what we're going on. Thank you. That's what I need to know. And just for the benefit of, again, of Mr. Uh, Kavanaugh and Mr. Polzenberg, I started out by discussing that in the evidentiary hearing, the terrible witnesses said that these documents were discovered as they were preparing to provide responses in the Henry case. That's why the relationship between what they were doing in Henry also was involved in their testimony before Judge Kishner, which is what we were going through when we were interrupted by Mr. Posenberg and Mr. Kavanaugh. Your Honor, when we left off, before the interruption, I was going through Mr. Sexton's testimony and how he admitted that of the five paragraphs, sorry, three paragraphs that we addressed in his examination, all three were false. And then, Your Honor, I had the opportunity of bringing on Mr. Kemper, who also agreed. But before we get there, I would ask the court to go to Exhibit 2, page 205. And this is where we kind of sum up where we were by this time in the evidentiary hearing. And it says, thank you, Let's see. I'm starting at line 20, which means that everyone you spoke to and everyone who suggested other locations suggesting to you that there is nothing else that they found based upon our conversation, their own conversations with them, were mistaken. Now, we'll put it in context. Mr. Kemper was being reported to by Mr. Sexton, Mr. Breeden, and Mr. Walters, all of them purportedly having checked their emails not finding anything. And going to page 29239, and this will bring it home for the uh, for Mr. Uh, Kavanaugh, Mr. Uh, Posenberg, lines two through five. And so the same search that was done for Henry should have been done in this case to capture communications in those years, correct? <coughs> correct. Your Honor, I think that Mr. Kavanaugh and Mr. Posenberg should have waited until we got here. But that shows you the relationship. This isn't me showing you everything that went on in the Hunwardson case just to inflame this court. First thing is, that's insulting to this court. Your Honor, you have one of the best judicial temperaments I've seen. And you don't get upset. You listen to the facts, you consider the law, and you make decisions. And you've been doing it now for 16 years? 18 plus. 18 plus. Your Honor, so I apologize I, if you thought I said you were a flame you by know anything. What? No, 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 guys, I said it. Guys, guys, <laughs> I don't get upset. I really don't. I'm Which serious. is what I said. Yeah, I mean, my point is this. I'm trying to figure, you know what the most difficult part of my job is? It's not the law. It's making sure I understand what the facts are. You know, and, and that's really what I drilled down on. 
Certain cases are a little bit more complex from a factual perspective, like some of the business court matters, because every operating agreement and or um, um, whatever might be different from case to case, because and it's all contractual based. I mean, when it comes to it, like products liability, the restatement of torts, for two A, kind of got that. Or if you want to talk about, or if you want to talk about uh, uh, the breach of the covenant of good faith and fair dealings contractually, non-tort, under, re, under the restatement of torts, uh, I'm sorry, restatement of contracts, either section 205 or 215, as it pertains to the justified expectations of the parties, I got that. I need to know what the facts are in this case. That's what I need to know. And when I talk about relationships, I'm, lo I'm, I'm looking at Mr. Parker's, uh, like page six of his motion. I want to know about the relationship or alleged relationship between real water and uh, pure purpose. And that's what, that's we're what I to. want to know. I that's know exactly what we're going to, Your Honor. I want to, I mean, and I don't know if there is one or not. You know, as I said, alleged relationship. Thank you. You know, I, I need to know that, you know, because potentially I can see where if there was a, a relationship that was established, then the liability in this case might be a little bit different. I mean, I understand that, I, I do. And so that's what I'm, I'm really focusing on because, you know, I mean, Mr. Parker makes allegations here, but the relationship is very, very important. Were they in some sort of joint marketing agreement? You, or, you are headed where I'm headed, John. I mean, I wanna know, that's what I wanna know because that's where it becomes really important. I'm not gonna get, uh, well, Judge, there's 200, I'm not, I don't, Care about the number of documents, it's for me, it's a lot. But I want to know about alleged relationships. Does that make you feel better, Mr. Gavin? <laughs> I'm not sure yet. Let me, yeah, let me get mean, back to you on that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, as far as what the fact, you know, alleged, I want to know that because hypothetically, if they had some sort of marketing agreement or an agreement together or something like that, that could impact the whole case from a discovery perspective. You know, I mean, and, and just as important too, and this is my point, Mr. Posenberg. Hypothetically, and I'm really focusing on this, if there was some sort of agreement in place between Real Water and uh, the defendant in this case, uh, Terrible Herbs, wouldn't somebody know about that? I'm not talking about the specifics, I'm talking about a relationship. You know, you know relationships are a funny thing, Your Honor. They start <laughs> at a certain level, and sometimes they go up and increase, and sometimes they go down. So if I were to tell the court, in approximately 2008, Terribles began marketing real water, and I'm not exactly sure if that's the date. And it was prior to an exclusive distribution agreement with Nevada Beverage, the largest distributor in, 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 the, in the state. And, and that exclusive distributorship started in 2010. Then the relationship of selling real water through Terrible Herbs may have changed as well. And five years later, changed again. And at the time, Mr. Henry has a claim, ever even thought about real water. And by the way, he's only ever had one receipt from Terribles for Blue Bunny ice cream. Mm. <laughs> you, you know, but the relationships have changed. They changed such that the people that gave those earlier de depositions in Hogwarts, and they didn't have a scorecard, perhaps, that was right up to date. And a good lawyer which Teddy Parker is, was taking full you know, advantage of pointing that out. But again, Your Honor, you've got exhibits on another case, and it's natural to want to know about those relationships. Of course, those are important, and, and the credibility of those people hinged on that, and that came out in the Hunwartson case. But right now, the relationships that were timely related to this case are what's important. And um, I would just say that about relationships, Your Honor, if that well, makes well, the and, court and, any and, more well, inclined well, to think that through. Well, my point is this, and understand this, Mr. Gavin, I'll add a case adverse to you. I would take your word for it, but I would trust and verify. Exactly. And that's what we're trying to do with the claims yeah. the plaintiffs made here but without any supporting evidence that there's any materiality to any of the documents that are now being produced at their request, without even the discovery hearing, saying that there was an abuse of discovery. They've come right to you seeking a, a sanctions order when there's no willfulness being shown by, by my client in this case. Right. But, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm going back to one of the reasons why I feel under pursuant to Rule 16.1, 
philosophically, uh, there's a duty and responsibility, of course, for these documents that are relevant. Right? Thank you. Number one. Absolutely. Secondly, um, let me finish. Let me finish. Uh, secondly, uh, we have in other in the other matter, we still have declarations that apparently, for whatever reason, and I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, were incorrect. How do you like that? That's better, right? Than I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah. And that's kind of my point, though. And, and, and see, when, and I understand sophisticated litigation, because at the end of the day, uh, you might be right, but you have to give the other time an opportunity to test it. And it becomes very difficult to test something when we're going to trial next, what is it, next month or month after? October. October, two months from now. And these documents were deposited when? Two weeks ago. That's two weeks ago. But Your Honor has to understand what those documents are. None of those documents have been shown to have any relevance to the claims of Mr. Henry at all, at all. And if you look at the search terms, Your Honor, they include every communication between these executives of Terrible Herbs and, and Nevada Beverage that don't have to tie in anything. Nevada Beverage, the biggest, the exclusive distributor for Budweiser and Anheuser-Busch in the state of Nevada which are sold every day, long before and long after real water sales. I mean, I get that. I mean, but so how do I kind of feel there? We are, well, Your Honor. I, I can't wait to continue addressing the court, and I again would suggest to Mr. Kavanaugh, my friend, that you uh, pull some of that before you... Uh, All right, well, uh, thank you, thank you. Go ahead, I'm this sorry. This is what I, I need education. I need to thank you. Thank I apologize you. if no, I no, stepped. No, no, no worries, Mr. Kavanaugh. I, Again, I have just waited because you don't know what's coming. Uh, <laughs> well, but we'll see. I, I, I know what came. It wasn't, it wasn't accurate. That's so, what I'm, so what you're I'm reacting to. That, that is part of my problem is that from the motion, I don't know what's coming. Well, the motion came before we had the 271,000 pages. And that's, so, but that's so, yet another issue, Judge. I mean, if they wanted to make an amended motion, here we are on no, I'm fine. order shortening time. And they're raising things, uh, you know, in the reply and in the hearing. I mean, I have some real due process problems. I understand most of you are civil lawyers, but, you know, the terms of the indictment, and it's a phrase I used in Hungwardson with, with, with Judge Kishner, is if, if there's going to be a motion that results in sanctions, I need to know what precisely it is. Because I think, Judge, you are at times talking about the relationship between Terribles and Real Water from page 6, line 21. But Mr. Parker seems in the argument to be talking about the relationship between Hunwardson and the Henry cases. I would so, give you the same advice, Mr. Polzenberg. Let, this, let my argument finish, and then you can address what you like. That's my due process problem, Judge. I shouldn't have a hearing have to wait to hear what Teddy says to know what the charges are against my client. I should have that in advance. It's notice and the opportunity to be heard, not opportunity to be heard and surprise. There's no surprises here. Your Honor, if I could. Well, I mean, I'm looking at his motion. He's alleging uh, misconduct, the failure to produce documents timely. He's seeking uh, sanctions. Uh, potentially strike the answer and so on and so on. Judge, that's Kafkaesque. I mean, just saying we're asking for sanctions. I mean, they didn't even specify in the 290 documents what documents that should have been produced earlier and what the prejudice is to them. It's all very broad based. Well, I don't here. think there's enough here to give me the opportunity to know what to say. Well, I'm looking here on page six of the motion, quote, now plaintiffs have lost their opportunity to have their experts examine the discoverable marketing materials because parties' expert deadlines have passed pursuant to the court order regarding discovery deadlines dated May 14th. Conclusory. You know under Johnny Riviera there are two factors the Supreme Court mainly looks at, willfulness and prejudice. They, these are just broad-based allegations without saying, look at this document, here's an affidavit from my expert who says I needed that document to be able to do this. 
This is all the kind of showing they need to get extreme sanctions. Huh. The court even said that in Nevada Power. Your Honor, may I continue? Yeah, you can. Thank you. To finish up with Mr. Kemper, Your Honor, I'd like the court to take again, take a look at exhibit uh, 2, page 246. And this was the culmination of my examination virtually all of the terrible witnesses. And it says here, and based upon their testimony, you now understand that they all gave misinformation on each of their declarations. Is that correct? He says that's correct. And go to the next page. And you did as well, correct? He says correct. So every witness, the terrible produced, gave false declarations in terms of communications with real water, agreements with real water, discussions with members of the real water staff being uh, Anthony Randolph, Amy Jones. Now, let's talk about the relationship between the companies, John. That's what I need to know. Thank you. Real water used, and this was testimony that in an evidentiary hearing you'd see this as well, used terribles as virtually its marketing arm. In fact, in Real Water's business plan, which was an exhibit in, I believe, the Gallagher trial, it was an exhibit in Hun Wartson, and I believe it was an exhibit in the uh, Wren case. That uh, business plan indicated that Real Water's promotional uh, uh, videos were being seen and used in virtually a hundred of terrible stores. Mr. Anthony Randolph said that he learned a lot working with Terrible Herbs on marketing, promoting. In fact, he said he spoke to Mr. Herbs. He said that that relationship was an important relationship to how real water got to the market. His own words, John. And I'm paraphrasing, but he's testified now, I believe, in three trials. In, in fact, in front of your honor, I believe, your honor. Additionally, just to wet Mr. Kavanaugh's whistle, Your Honor, 271,000 pages is very difficult to incorporate in any case this late in the game. I don't care how big your firm is. Mr. Kemp's firm is probably one of the largest plaintiff's firms in the state. And even his firm doesn't have the bandwidth at this late stage to try to figure out 271,000 pages just produced on July 24th. But we were able to find a few zingers. We were able to find that at least from 2008, June 24, 2008, these were your disclosures we just got. No, but, and so, I mean, you, hold on. but Judge, I have a real issue with this. You're on order short in time. They're bringing in things, arguments based on things that they haven't uh, made before this this is not appropriate and it doesn't provide us adequate notice of what their arguments are for prejudice your honor these are their documents we just got them we're trying to pour through them as we speak and it indicates just from our initial review your honor because we can't you know we haven't gotten to 271,000 pages we found indications of, of at least 25 in-person or video meetings from 2008 all the way to 2020, Your Honor. Well, see, that goes back to my original statement. Doesn't somebody have personal knowledge of this? Bingo. They should have had personal knowledge of this when they were on this, when they uh, did their first initial 16.1 over a year ago. These documents, and I love what Mr. Kavanaugh said, and that's why I warned him about talking before I got finished. He said, how do we know these documents are relevant? If they weren't relevant, they wouldn't have been produced at any time. If they didn't were weren't required to be produced pursuant to 16.1, they wouldn't have been produced. These documents talk about relationships in the form of meetings. This one is from Mark Walters, again, a person who was uh, brought in during the evidentiary hearing, and it says, subject, real water presentation. How could this not be relevant? And what Mr. Kavanaugh feels, fails to understand, Your Honor, 
which this court understands because this court handled the Gallagher matter. Punitive damages is at issue for real water and every distributor and every retail, retailer. That's what the complaint is the same in every case. These cases were coordinated for, in, in uh, July of 22 for discovery purposes. Their first initial 16.1 production in Hunwartson should have had this, these documents produced. Because the word real water is in this document. So when Mr. Kavanaugh jumps up and says, oh, we got new search terms, this document doesn't mention Nevada beverage. But it does mention real water. And how do you not produce real water related documents relating to a communication, agreements, discussions, these names are on them? Mr. Waters' email should have been checked, and this document should have been provided in 2021. And again in 2022, if you want to break it down by case, and certainly in January of 2024. I'm sure, Your Honor. We don't even know what this document the, the, that well, Mr. Parker's holding up and hasn't given to the judge, hasn't given to counsel. I don't know what the date of that document I is. I just told you the date. June 24, 2008. Your document. What does that have to do with Tukwati Henry's claims in oh, 2008? Lord. Your Honor, that Mr. Kavanaugh, we shouldn't change. be arguing amongst each other. You're right. I'm, I'm so sorry. I apologize. That's oh, yeah. that's, I know you got carried I'm away. I'm sorry. And I followed suit. So. But I don't have in front of me what you're claiming the judge should know, and we don't know how <clears> accurate. Before, and I, before I issue, I mean, of course, we're going to give you an opportunity to look at the documents. Uh, you know, here, here's my point, and, and I think this is a valid point. It, it appears to me that maybe I'm wrong. But the uh, defense hasn't reviewed the 270,000 documents either. That's absolutely right. We didn't even set, we didn't edit them. We collected them with a third party vendor. We took them and had another vendor convert them to PDF from native form and bait stamp them. We didn't bait stamp them. And we had them put in the depository and got access, made them searchable for, for plaintiff's counsel. We haven't reviewed one of those documents which we collected at their request and at our expense. And what in the world this thing has to do with anything when Terrible Herbs had a different distributor a couple of years later, something that happened in 2008, how does that have any bearing on the claims, be it punitive or compensatory, and, and as time went on? There's a lot of things that happened in 2008 that had nothing to do with what was going on in 2009, let alone 2019, when the plaintiff allegedly, can't prove it, bought, his mom bought the real water. <laughs> what does this have to do with the cause of any injury or any of the claims in this case? So and I don't even know what it is because I don't have it in front Judge, of me. Judge, let me so, raise hold on, hold on. one. Hold on, let me I'll raise, raise no, let me raise one other point because I stood up to raise this earlier and we got sidetracked. Uh, Sixteen point one is an irrelevant standard. It's we have a duty to disclose documents that we quote may use to support its claims or defenses. It's <laughs> I'm sorry, Dan, you, you've said this. I think the court knows 16.1 better than everyone in this, probably in this courtroom right now. I understand that, but I understand 16.1.1. Yes. That's 16. not a point. 16.1.2. Because remember, we had different versions of 16.1. People don't realize that. In fact, I think the first version was probably the best version because you had staggered experts. You know, that would have been best. Well, no, well this is, but this is a different issue. In, in 2019, the Supreme Court changed the standard for disclosure from relevance to documents that you may use. It's not just relevance to any party. It's only documents that the disclosing party may use. So, Mr. Fulford, I appreciate that. Thank God I started this. That would be part of the defense. <laughs> thank you. Too. Thank you. I, mean, I get it. I listen. Yeah. But, but my point is this. I'm really, and this is, I think we're all getting far afield, and I think this is a little bit more nuanced. Uh, maybe it did happen in 2008. That's the time. But, but I go back to Ronald Reagan and trust but verify. And here's my point. You could be 100% right, but if the documents aren't produced, how can they go through it and trust and verify? 
Yeah. And, and that's kind of like, and that's so overlooked. And, and I do understand what you were saying, uh, Mr. Bosenberg, you say, well, Judge, you know, we don't even know what documents he's talking about. I'm not going to make a decision until we know exactly what, the, what some of the documents are, but there's no way you can find out by reviewing 271,000 pages of documents. And just as important, too, remember, uh, even under Rule 37, I mean, we have, uh, it's not self-executing, right? And then we have issues regarding substantial justification and or harmless. And one of the decisions that's been made by our federal courts, not I'm talking about nationally, that if it's your document that was produced maybe before trial, that might be harmless. And so I don't want to get far afield. I'm not looking at it from necessarily intentional. I'm, not, I'm, I'm trying to understand what the facts are. And you're not helping me, right? Because we're quibbling. I'm trying to dig deep and find out what's going on here. Right, and I understand Johnny Ribeiro. I get it. I understand Bass Davis. I get it. I understand um, I think it was Judge White and the um, Nevada Power. Oh, no, I'm sorry, that wasn't that Mendoza or White. Which one? That was Judge White. Judge White was versus, yeah, yeah. versus you yeah. or Illinois. Yeah, I understand. I mean, I know the cases, <laughs> but I'm just trying to get the nuance because I think. From a complex civil litigation perspective, I understand that you know if documents aren't produced, they potentially impact how you prosecute your claim for relief. Absolutely, I get, I, I get that. So and I don't know how, what impact it has in this case, but that's why I'm listening. But we won't get anything done. We have to come back again. I have hearings at two o'clock. We don't have lunch. We haven't done our cardio. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a cardio. He did say cardio. Oh, I did. Oh my God, we've talked about cardio back in the endoscopy cases. Oh, absolutely. Well, we're doing some cardio. You've been getting up and down a lot. There you go. That's it. No, I, that's back, back in that case, we were both doing cardio. Now I'm not doing it. I'm doing it still, Mr. Bozenberg. I'm Good for it. you, Judge. Yes. You know, <laughs> the point the Russian terriers probably keep it up. The point being, the relationship that spanned well over 10 years continued all the way until virtually months before the recall. And we just, and this is just a you know, a small amount of the documents we've been able to review that we know not only are relevant, but are particularly uh, important when it comes to our punitive damage claim. This is one of the reasons why Rio Water became as large as it was in Southern Nevada. You know, we also found, and again, these are all bait stamp T-H-S-E-T-E-C, which is a prefix for terrible herbs. It's S-E-T-E-C. S-E-T-E-C. Correct. That's the C-T-E-C. which is the... So, Your Honor, these documents, all 271,000 pages, we, although we've not been able to go through them, I now hear that defendants have not been able to go through them either. No. Which, which tells me that Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Kavanaugh has been arguing about documents that he hasn't reviewed. Which also means that Mr. Polzenberg, in terms of the impact of those documents, has been arguing about documents he hasn't reviewed. Well, I'm what I make my due process <laughs> argument again. Well, you should speak to your uh, to counsel who actually produced the documents before you get upset with plaintiffs who just received them. So, Your Honor, the point being is there, is there a reverse due process argument? Because my point is this: if the documents would have been timely produced, maybe we we would have a better indication. That's right. Judge, you haven't even heard That's the story about, you heard part of it about why they weren't produced earlier. We were waiting for them to do the computer search. We made it available to them. They didn't <coughs> do it, and so we did it for them. I would keep so one thing in here's, mind. Here's the thing, gentlemen, I'm not telling you this. I'm not making a decision today because we're not going to finish today. Yeah, we're not. Uh, we're, not we're not. It's. It's. I have a 2 o'clock hearing. What do we have to do? Yeah. And I bash. It's a motion to dismiss on the motion. Yeah, we, we have some TRO stuff. Right, and I have a one o'clock Supreme Court You got to go do what you have to do, Mr. Posenberg. I respect that. You, you haven't even had lunch. You, you know, haven't had lunch. Yeah, we have neither. We, that's why we're going to break because I don't want to violate any. Uh, any uh, federal and or state labor laws. I haven't spoken yet, but I mean, given the defense's admission that they don't know 
or see these documents and they can't meaningfully dispute that they're relevant? Oh, no, 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 no. I am. I, I, I dispute that. It's that. their burden to come in and show yeah, prejudice. Well, well, let me finish my suggestion, Your Honor. Um, and, I, and I told this to Mr. Poulsen before the hearing. Uh, it seems to me that we're heading for an evidentiary hearing here. And what I would suggest is we just pick a day. day and I don't think you have anywhere near enough to have an evidentiary hearing. I don't think you can set an evidentiary hearing till we finish this motion hearing. So, and we're not going to finish this motion hearing today. Right. So, if you want to you pick a like date, to get a date. I have works. Friday. I, Your Honor, I can't do Friday. I have a a multi fatality case out of state. I have we have Monday for. morning. I may do the Monday. Give me a second. We can, I can do Friday. I just think we'll do Friday. I know that. <laughs> I heard we, you. We can start Monday morning at 9.30. We have to be done at noon. I have can't, can't judge. Well, what's your next I have I have a hearing yeah, where my I'm client sorry, is... You don't have, Mr. Right. Bosberg, you don't have to give me an explanation. It's a judge. I'm, uh, what about Friday, the 16th? I think I can do Friday, you know. Okay, I'll do whatever is convenient for. for yeah, I can move Friday. Friday. Council and Dan. The 16th. Yeah. This, what's on here? How about 9:30? And I got the rest of the day, right? Well, if you got the rest of the day, make it 10. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta walk the dog too, you know. <laughs> Mr. Cavanaugh, for you, we'll make it. 10. Isn't that close? Thank you, sir. No, no, no. <laughs> I never get upset. <laughs> That's what I say. I, I never meant to imply that. No, no. But I'm oh, saying. I always mean to imply it, and then you, oh, you go, always do. oh, damn. Right? Great. So, the 16th, 10 o'clock a.m., Mr. Parker hasn't turned over the floor yet. I'm going to listen to everybody, um, um, and we have to make some decisions ultimately then, because this case is right around the corner, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, we resolved the jury questionnaire issue, right? Six times this one. That's right. Any other checklist so. items I have? Albertson's will make sure I have a order to do that. All right. Thank you. Thanks again for your time, Your Honor. I appreciate it. Thanks to everyone. Yeah. I'm trying to get everyone to say thank you.